Good morning, friends, and welcome to another Physically Distant Service. Uh, we are recording this on Wednesday, and there's a lot happening on this Wednesday in our nation's capital. And so we don't know when we um, show this on Sunday where we exactly will be. But I have really been in prayer the last few days as our country faces so many challenges. And yet we need to come together in unity and work together for, these, for all of these terribly important issues. We welcome Stan Banker today. Uh, Bob is still on vacation, and we've asked Stan Banker to join us, and um, we're so glad that he's going to be here. So you'll hear from him in a few moments. There are a couple of announcements. Our adult Sunday school class will begin again next Sunday. So if you're interested in joining that class, please let the office know that you'd like the Zoom link. We continue to have opportunities for unprogrammed worship and meditation. Monday at 11.15 is a meditation until noon. On Wednesday evening, we have unprogrammed worship from 7 o'clock. And on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, we have unprogrammed worship. So if you'd like the link to any of these opportunities to gather together electronically, please let the office know. And Amy Perry would like to announce that she's um, having, she's kind of hosting a new Bible study on the book of Psalms. They're going to study the book of Psalms over a 13 week period. Uh, this started um, on January 7th, but it will run for another 12 weeks. On, at 7.30 p.m. on Thursday evenings. So if you'd like to join in this Bible study, please contact the office and we'll send you the Zoom link. Please join me in prayer today, a prayer for resting in God's love. God of goodness, I come into your presence so aware of my human frailty and yet overwhelmed by your love for me. I thank you that there is no human experience that I might walk through where your love cannot reach me. If I climb the highest mountain, you are there. And yet if I find myself in the darkest valley of my life, you are there. Teach me today to love you more. Help me to rest in that love that asks nothing more than the simple trusting heart of a child. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning is Matthew 13, 1 through 9 from the NRSV version. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil. And they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. What in the world is God doing? If the farmer in this parable is supposed to be God, and it is, this God goes against almost every economic principle we most highly value. This farmer God throws seed around like the wealthiest among us throw money around. Not only that, but this God is utterly incompetent at marketing and farming. Recklessly tossing valuable seed in no particular direction, ending up where most of it is almost, has almost no chance of taking root and growing. This God is wasteful. The return on investment of God's enterprise is far less than it could be. God sure didn't get his Master of Business Administration from Indiana University's Kelly School of Business or his doctorate of agricultural science from Purdue University. So it is fair, fair to ask, what in the world is God doing? We know better than to be reckless and wasteful. Many of us were brought up in families where we weren't allowed to get up from the table until we'd finished every last scrap of food from our plate. My mother used to remind us kids that there were starving children in India who would love to have the food we were wasting. So I offered to help her pack it up and put it in the mail to India. But my mother, my mother was not amused and she was not budging. Food was not to be wasted. And that kind of frugality applies to other things, too. During these times of environmental sensitivity, some socially conscious, conscious folks have bumper, bumper stickers that ask, what would Jesus drive? But it's not really a question that seeks an answer because they're already answering it by the kind of vehicles they drive and put those bumper stickers on. You never see one of those bumper stickers on a Cadillac Escalade. Those bumper stickers are found on a Toyota Prius, or a little smart for two, three cylinder shoebox of a car, or a car that our beloved Dan Mitchell might drive. Or maybe Jesus, maybe Jesus would not have any car at all. Maybe Jesus would ride a bike to church to reduce our dependence upon foreign oil and to keep the planet from hydrocarbon disaster. Jesus would conserve natural resources and live more frugally to save Mother Earth. Because as we all know, we have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Well, maybe that's true. Maybe that's true for Jesus, but it's not true for Jesus' Holy Father, not God, not the wasteful spendthrift, throw seed around like it's going out of style farmer in today's parable. Oh, no. 
No way. If Jesus is putting around town on a little Vespa motor scooter in order to conserve, God is zooming down the street with a pedal to the metal in a gas-guzzling 5.0 liter V8 supercharged Land Rover, mega-sized Range Rover SUV. Look at God. Just look at God in this story, recklessly tossing that seed around without any concern whatsoever about waste. What in the world is God doing? Some seed fell upon the path. Some fell on rocky places. Some seed fell among thorns. And luckily, some seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop. What a thought-provoking parable. What is Jesus getting at here? Maybe Jesus is telling us this parable of the wasteful farmer to jar our sensibilities and to create some tension around the values we hold so dear. Maybe Jesus is showing us that there is more to life than the bottom line. That life is not measured in terms of return on investment or production or in terms of dollar and cents. Maybe Jesus is teaching us that the central issue for us should not be our sense of economy, but rather our sense of humanity. Not even our Quaker frugality, but our godly generosity. Or maybe, maybe, just maybe, the parable is simply asking, what is the worth of one single human soul? A farmer went out to sow. Some seeds fell upon the path. Some seed fell on rocky places. Other seed fell among thorns. And some seed luckily fell on good soil where it produced a crop. I wonder why God would throw so much seed into so many hopeless places. Wouldn't God be more responsible and wise to just cut the losses and stop throwing good seed away after bad? Wouldn't the number crunchers on Wall Street give God a raise and a pat on the back if God just stopped being wasteful and produced bigger harvests with less seed? Those are the kind of folks currently managing my Brussels sprouts packages. I love Brussels sprouts with balsamic vinegar and sea salt on top. May not be your thing, but it sure is mine. I have them for lunch at least once every week, sometimes twice. But over the years, those wicked number crunchers at the Brussels sprouts home office keep raising the price of my Brussels sprouts while lowering the number of Brussels sprouts inside, and I'm mad. I'm ticked off. I'm imagining the day I open up my Brussels sprouts package to discover only three puny little Brussels sprouts inside. When Brussels sprouts have yielded to pure capitalism, you know the world has gone to pot, or maybe I should say to a very small pan. This is one of the deepest struggles we Christians face. In a world of capitalism that measures value in terms of economic efficiency, God calls us to take up entirely different value system. The question God asks is not, how much does it cost? How much does it produce? But rather, what is the worth of one single human soul. The parable of the sower tells us about a God who is absolutely unafraid to waste resources in the effort to bring life to others. So this God of the Bible that Jesus teaches us is the true nature of God. God, just like this imprudent farmer, 
in this parable intentionally scatters the seed of his word east and west, north and south. God sows among believers and doubters, good people and bad, those who are ready to receive the word and those whose hearts are hardened. God spreads the seed on the pathway and on rocky soil, among the thorns, and every once in a while, that seed finds fertile ground, and it takes root and grows and produces immense fruit, fruit like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. While we secular human beings might consider this a waste, it is not a waste at all. It is the very definition of God. It is the very definition of grace. Grace, grace is always a my cup is full and overflowing kind of generosity. It is the very essence of our faith. It is lavish, extravagant, unmerited love poured out for family, friends, enemies, neighbors, strangers, poor, immigrants, sick, diseased, Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, agnostics, atheists, as well as for all creation in our beloved environment. If you ever wonder what God is like, you don't need to look any further than this parable. This is what God is like. And this is exactly the same nature we are called to exemplify as Christians. Lavish, extravagant, wasteful love. Surprise of surprises. When it comes to grace, God is no Toyota Prius, no Chevrolet Volt, no little smart for two shoebox of a car, no Vespa driver, no bicycle rider. God is driving an absolute, unashamed, unabashed grace guzzler. And the tipping point that makes the difference between our human values and God's values is simply this. Economics, marketing produces a faith that is all about us and our personal well-being and can be quantified, analyzed, justified to bless us and our kind. However, God's grace is something entirely different. At times, it won't even make common sense, basic common sense. At times, we won't understand it because God's grace produces a faith that is totally about loving everyone and concerned about everyone's well-being. I realize common sense is in short supply these days. It's kind of like deodorant. Those who need it most don't use it. But whether it makes good sense, it's common sense, you understand it or don't, God's grace is there for all. So, what in the world is God doing? What in the world does the church think it's doing? What in the world do Christians think they're doing? Saving the world both literally and figuratively. That's what. And how can the world and our country and ourselves be saved? With grace and a whole lot of it. Any so-called Christian who is in the business of dogmatizing the faith and creating rules and regulations and building walls and forms and rituals and hoops to jump through and judging others day in and day out and scaring people with damnation and satanically preaching a prosperity gospel and failing to see that of God in everyone and proclaiming themselves purer than others. 
and becoming in the process a religious prude is no Christian at all. To be a Christian, your one and only focus should be to be a grateful grace receiver who is equally focused on being a generous grace distributor. Jesus taught, and Paul put an exclamation point on it later on, we are saved by grace and grace alone. And God is extravagant when it comes to grace. God is generous beyond belief. God is even seemingly wasteful. God doesn't care how much it costs because God knows how much each and every soul, each and every person is worth, regardless of all the barriers society and religion might add into the equation. Stuff such as race, nationality, gender, religion, sexual orientation, political views. If you really want to describe God in a few words, here it is. Here it is. God is love. Love is God. God is grace. Grace is God. If you and I are to follow the witness of our God, then we ought to be equally extravagant, equally wasteful, equally grace-guzzling in our lives, extravagant in extending our love and God's love to everyone without any thought whatsoever that such grace will ever run dry because it won't. It won't. So it's about time. It's about time for all of us to start feeling a nudge to live on the wild, lavish, extravagant side of faith. We need to go right on ahead and place absolutely no limits on God's generosity. So if you are serious about your Christian and Quaker faith, here's your one and only job this week and every week for the rest of your life. Go spread some grace. Go spread some grace. And when you do, make sure you're downright generous as you do it. Don't adjudge, assume, build walls. Just go out and spread God's grace far and wide. As we enter into a time of listening and sensing God's presence among us, let us consider these three queries. Number one, are there any persons, ways, and areas I am currently placing limits on God's grace? Number two, how can I distribute God's grace to myself, my loved ones, my families? my faith community, my world. And number three, how may I need to adjust my soul, my words, my attitudes, and my actions in order to fully offer God's love without limit?
the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. other we will walk hand in hand we will walk with each other we will walk hand in hand and together we'll spread the news that god is in our land and they'll know we are christians by our love by our love yes they'll know we are christians by our love Praise to the Father from all things come, and all oh, praise to Christ Jesus, His only Son, and all oh, praise to the Spirit who makes us one, and them know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, them know we are Christians by our love. Our benediction today is from Psalms 37, three through six. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn your vindication like the noonday sun. Have a great week, friends.